So, uh, so let me pray and get us started. All right, Lord, I thank you for uh, this day. This each day is a gift from you, and here we have uh, reached the end, toward the end of one day, uh, and. Again, you have provided all that we need, and you have brought us together for a reason. Lord, we pray your blessing on this time together uh, as we spend time in your word, that we would continue to uh, not just learn and add knowledge, but that you would also help us grow our faith, that we would get to know one another, and that you might be uh, accomplishing your work in us. And uh, so, Lord, as we sit down together, I pray that you would also... Uh, maybe bring into our conversation questions that we have um, so that we're able to apply your word uh, to those questions that we have. And so we ask your blessing here tonight. Amen. All right, uh, let's get started with um, chapter... You know, I just uh, was thinking, Andy and Nicole, I've seen you now at least once. Did I give you a book? I didn't. I, I thought of that, and I'm like, ah, I did not do that again. So I apologize for that. We need. I need to. Uh, if you can help this absent-minded pastor remember to give you a book the next time that you see me, I would appreciate it. So, what what is going to help us? What helps us in this class is the fact that, you know, if you do forget a book, one I have extras here, by the way, but. Um, we're, as long as you have a Bible, you should be able to follow along because that's really our main textbook. So you do have a Bible at home, though. All right. Yeah. It's not packed away in a box somewhere. He does keep his word because he dropped this off at our house the other that's day. That's right. That's right. And if you do need me to drop one off, I can do that. So. All right. Um, so if you, for those of you that have your book, I uh, open up to chapter 3, and we finished up with um, that first part of chapter 3, and we're now on page 15 in that book. Page 15? Page 15. And I wanted to, uh, just I realized last week, you know, I said that we were going, I was going to buy us some time by... Uh, moving into chapter 3 a little bit, finishing up talking about Jesus. Um, <clears throat> let me just maybe refresh our memories. So the whole class is talking about our relationship with God in terms of adoption. And the first class talked about why we needed to be adopted because of sin. Sin ruined that relationship with God. So um, God had to take some steps to make it possible for us to become, to reestablish, to heal that broken relationship. And we talked about how Jesus did that. And then the question is, well, what kind of God do we have? What kind of God would want us and go through all the, the trouble of redeeming us and, and making us his own? So um, to last week and this week, we're taking a look at God. Who is God? Well, God has revealed himself to us as Father, as Son, and as Holy Spirit. And so last week we looked at God the Father, and then we, la we finished up with God the Son, Jesus. And now tonight we're going to be addressing the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. All right? So having refreshed our memory a little bit of where we've been and what we're going to be looking at tonight... Let me ask you, from last week or just in general, um, are, do you have any questions or thoughts? Maybe there was one that I thought that I have to see if I can get back. I just realized there was a thought. Oh, I do have a thought. So, but I'll ask you first. Um, anything at all that you've, is on your mind or wanted to bring up? I mentioned last week, we had a conversation. I don't remember who said what anymore, but I remember something I said, and I feel like I didn't quite finish that thought. Um, we got into a really great subject came up about can we know 
can we be certain of eternal life for ourselves? Do we know that if today, if we died, we would be in heaven? And we talked about how um, our salvation, our ticket to heaven, doesn't depend on us at all. That it's 100% on Jesus. Jesus completed all the work for us. Everything that needed to be done. Um, and so trusting in him, heaven is a gift. And I said, nobody in heaven deserves to be there. And I also said, this is the thought that I remembered, I, what I remembered me saying, and I wanted to maybe expand on that a little bit, was I said, um, good people go to hell and bad people go to heaven. I said, there are good people who go to hell and there are bad people who go to heaven. And the reason I like to say that that way is because that gets directly at that mistaken idea that we have that somehow it's good people who go to heaven. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven sinners go to heaven. The Bible doesn't talk about good people and bad people. The Bible only talks about sinners. The whole world is full of sinners. We're all sinners. So there's not good person, bad person. It's sinner, 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 sinner. We're all sinners. And the only way to get into heaven for a sinner is to be forgiven by Jesus. So that's what I wanted to expand on. Something I said just in passing, but I didn't say any more. Now, having opened up that conversation again, I'll ask you, any more thoughts on that? Yes. What are you laughing for? <laughs> you got more than one. <laughs> <laughs> if, if Jesus judged the people to be in heaven, then don't they deserve to be there? If, I understand what you're saying, but if, but if he's judged that they should be there, don't they deserve to be there? Help me understand what you're saying, because I don't know if I'm quite clear on that. Well, you were saying that, uh, sorry, I don't know how to put words in your mouth. I had this thought in my mind. Yeah. You said that there, the people that are in heaven don't deserve to be there. Correct. So I understand kind of what you're saying, but then on the other side of that coin, I'm like, well, if they've been judged and he deemed that they should be there, they be there? So what the no when I they say no one to deserves there? to be there. Don't they deserve to be there? They haven't earned it. It's a gift. Nobody in heaven has earned their way into heaven. Nobody. I, I that's what I, I'm saying. Yeah, I agree with you. But I, I think that's different than the other <laughs> I and so it the only if you want to understand it, I get your point is you're saying they belong there, most definitely, yeah. because Jesus died for them, because forgave their sins. They definitely belong there. God put, you know, wrote their names in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. Absolutely, they belong there, but they don't deserve to be there. I agree. So, and that's why words are important. You're right. I'm really glad. See, this is what I, I really enjoy conversation, and so many times... I mean, you know, we watch the world around us and people can't have, they've lost the ability to have a conversation. And so I really do value talking, you know, and exchanging ideas and questions. I love that. So, well, are you wanting to ration out your questions over the weeks, through the weeks? So if you have more, um, you know. I, I do, but they'll only come to me when I when they come to me. All right. <laughs> that's what I told you. And I said it about Wednesday when I meant Monday. That's what I told you last week. It's like, I got questions. I can't wait for the answers okay. till Monday. But, and I told him Wednesday, and he looked at me like I had a second head. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was one of them. You know, I honestly, I saw it. Yes. Yeah, anymore, that's what I'm having to do, too, is write things down. <laughs> right at that moment. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll forget it. That's right. What was that again? You want it right there. You have notes for everything. I go to the store with a note, and then I come out and it's still in my pocket. 
<laughs> you forgot to look at the note. You get you need a note to look at the note in your pocket. You just brought the note with you. Write them and leave them. Well, I hope that everybody at home that you could hear that conversation. Yeah? Okay. I was gonna bring up a point, I don't know if it makes any sense. That you mentioned that in order to get to heaven, you just have to acknowledge that Jesus died on a cross for your sins. Is that what is that what I got out of that? Even I think I would say more than that. I'm trying to think of how the Bible uh, Jesus says in John three sixteen that whoever believes in yeah. Jesus, I mean the devil will acknowledge the fact that Jesus died on a cross to pay for the sins of the world, but the devil will not, you know, the devil in no way believes in Jesus as Savior. So for us, you know, I think just to try to use the words of the Bible to answer those questions, that question would be, you know, the, that's one way the Bible talks about is believing. So it's one thing to know. Uh, I, some, in confirmate, junior high confirmation, I, at, I use this, ask the kids this riddle. Um, I say people miss, a lot of people miss heaven by 18 inches. And I, and I say, what does that mean? And I let them think about it for a while. I don't think anybody's ever gotten it. Does anybody know? Everybody, anybody ever hear that? A lot of people miss heaven by 18 inches. 18 inches is the difference in the distance between the head and the heart. And so a lot of people know about Jesus. They could be, they could have heard about Jesus all the time, and it's in either one ear or out the other. What matters though is whether we or not we believe it. So I, I, you know, I think that's where I, I would say, yeah, that could be, yeah. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, and there's a lot of people too. I think I don't, I don't know how many, but there's certainly a good number of people who have faith in their religion. You know, in the in terms of, you know, they again it goes back to where are you putting your trust in Jesus a hundred percent or in being a good person and going to church enough, reading your Bible enough, praying enough being good enough. Um, so people are, are um, sometimes I get, I'm left wondering, you know, I can't see their faith to know, but it, I'm sometimes I wonder, like, where is their faith in? Um, so again, they, they've heard about Jesus a lot, but uh, again, it's about believing in Jesus. Yeah. Well, good. So hopefully our wheels are turning a little bit and uh, we're off to a good start. So unless there's any other comments, we'll jump in then to page 15 um, in our workbook. And I said we were going to be looking at God, the Holy Spirit. So let's do that. Uh, that first text uh, I'd like us to look at. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 12. 1785, says Barbara. All right. Uh, and this has us reading verses 1 2 and 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. Would somebody be willing to read? Oh, Carol? Yeah. Now about spiritual gifts, brothers. I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. All right. Notice what that last, that verse 3 says. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So that means in and of ourselves, in and of myself, Kevin, um, 
I, on my own, cannot say Jesus is Lord. I can't do it. I don't have the strength and ability on my own. Anybody who has, uh, who says, who believes in Jesus has come to that point because of the Holy Spirit and only because of the Holy Spirit. And like I said at the beginning of our class, um, every week we're going to be building on what's come before. That first week, the first class, remember what we said. What did sin do to us? Sin did not just make us bad. Sin left us dead. And so if, a, you know, if we are going to be made alive, if we're not, and, and also blind, if we're, if we're going to be able to see and believe, something has to be done to us. And the Holy Spirit is the one, the Bible says, that's responsible for creating this faith in us. So faith itself is not a product of us, something that we do. It's not a good work that we do. It's a good work that God, the Holy Spirit, produces in us so that we can't take credit for it. Um, I don't know if it was last, well, down the road we're definitely going to get to the, a text that I had in mind, but we'll see. it. Every week we kind of touch on things that we've said and we'll keep adding layers to it. So, uh, so when it comes to the Holy Spirit, just an example. So how can, I like pictures. I think in pictures. So one way that I like to, or I, I think about this is um, rather than somehow uh, giving ourselves credit for that, we, what we might say is that just like when you're maybe on a school playground and they're choosing teams. Um, you are. You can say I was chosen. Um, God, the Holy Spirit, worked in you that faith to make you part of uh, His team, so to speak. And uh, so, rather than us being the one choosing, God, the Holy Spirit's the one working that in us. So we can say we've been chosen rather than we are choosing. That would be the more accurate, according to the Bible. Again, the Holy Spirit gets the credit. That's what this is saying. So, well, let's keep going. Um, uh, I let me just real let me take a look at the next page. We don't have a lot of passages in this text, so uh, or in this chapter. Um, so let's look at the next uh, John chapter fourteen. We'll just take a glance there. John chapter, turn left from 1 Corinthians and go to John 14. 16, yeah, there's a whole bunch of verses there. John chapter 14 is on page 1675. But we're starting with verse 16, so that's on page 1676. And we're jumping around... Um, and what we're looking at in chapter 14, 15, and 16 here in John's Gospel are what are some names that are given to the Holy Spirit? Um, God, the, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit uh, claim there are a lot of names for God in the Bible. God chooses different names because God is so vast and great that He's bigger than any one name can fully describe him. So he has many names. God the Holy Spirit is referred to here in John chapter 14, uh, verse 16 and 17. Jesus says, and I will ask, so Jesus is speaking, get this. He says, I will ask the Father. Let me just pause here and say, well, if God were just taking different forms all along, Jesus couldn't say, I will ask the Father. That wouldn't make sense. He, he wouldn't say, well, I'll ask myself when I'm playing the Father later on. The Father is a separate person. Jesus here is a separate person. So Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. So here Jesus is referring to himself. He's speaking as himself, referring to the Father, and referring to the Holy Spirit. 
and he calls him the counselor and the spirit of truth. Who's the counselor? The Holy Spirit. Oh, okay. Okay, I read it three times, like, and I'm like, got a little confused there. Okay. And, and so when the Bible here uses the word counselor, it's not just, it's not so much as, oh, Holy Spirit, you know, I had this really bad day and I'm feeling kind of down today. It's not that kind of counselor. Think of a legal counsel so that he is um, representing us before God and um, declaring us, uh, connecting us to Jesus and all that he has done. And so the Holy Spirit is that um, functioning uh, person who delivers to us all those things that are necessary that sinners need, forgiveness and healing and all those things. So he does counsel, provide wisdom, all of that. But it's more in the sense of a legal. Um, spirit of truth. Um, so what is the job of the Holy Spirit? To teach us about Jesus? To connect us to Jesus? Counsel. Counsel. Mm -hmm. And the, something just a quick, something interesting about the Holy Spirit to me is that the Holy Spirit never draws attention to himself. If you want to ask yourself, is this of the Holy Spirit? Um, one way that you can tell whether or not something is of the Holy Spirit, if it is pointing you to Jesus, if it points you away from Jesus, you can be certain that it is not of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit will not even draw attention to himself. Hey, look at me, look at how wonderful, look at what I'm doing look, versus the Father or the, or the Son. The Holy Spirit's job is always to point us to Jesus because Jesus is the means by which God saved us. All right, so our, uh, the object of our faith, you know, in our salvation is Jesus. All right, um, let's turn from John to turn right and let's go to Acts, the very next book, just a few pages over, Acts chapter 2. So we can't talk about we can't talk about the Holy Spirit without going to the day of Pentecost. And let me give you just a, a little context of what was happening. So Pentecost happened 10 days after Jesus' ascension. So Jesus died, rose again, Easter, Good Friday, Easter. For 40 days, Jesus appeared to people, spoke to his disciples, um, and then 40 day, after those 40 days, Jesus ascended into heaven. And then Jesus told his disciples to go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. And 10 days later, that's when Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, and they were all gathered together to celebrate a Jewish festival called Pentecost. And what we're going to be reading is there are people there from all over to celebrate this Jewish festival. And so it was a great opportunity to, with all these people gathered together, a great opportunity to, uh, to lead people to Jesus. And um, so that's what we're finding here. And you want to re I think we need to remember that Jesus was Jewish. His disciples were Jewish. Um, they, the Old Testament was pointing to Jesus. And this is just a, 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 another quick note, um, but all of the Jewish festivals pointed to Jesus in some way. And we're going to look at, down the road, we'll look at the Passover. And... Um, and the connection to the Lord's Supper. Jesus, they, the disciples were celebrating the Passover when he, he made the new meal called the, that we call the Lord's Supper. All the Jewish, all the important salvation events happened on Jewish festival days. And one thing that I, and it's not just my idea, but I, ha, I was thinking about that and I was like, well, the only, there's only one unfulfilled Jewish festival left that isn't 
that something hasn't happened yet, the Feast of Trumpets. And what does the Bible say in Revelation that um, the trumpet will sound and Jesus will appear with his archangels? And when do, in the Jewish year is the Feast of Trumpets? It's in September, October. And so every year, in the back of my mind, I'm wondering, could this be the year? Could this September, October be the year? I just, every year, now we just start made it into November, so yeah. I don't know. I, I'm, that's just, Jesus, you can't, if he comes back in November, I'm not going to be like, what are you doing, Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> I had you coming back in September, October, you're late. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's something I think about. So here, though, they are, they're celebrating this Jewish festival, and uh, let me read here and listen to what happened. This is the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the, who is they? All the first disciples. Not only the 11, you know, the 12 minus Judas, but also Jesus' mother Mary, the Mary Magdalene. All the, all the first Christians were able to fit into one room. Imagine that. All right? They were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. And then, um, so Peter then gets up and he preaches. Who does he talk about? Jesus. Jesus. Look at what he tells them. Turn to uh, verse 37. Actually, back up uh, to verse 36. 36 through 40. Peter says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. you imagine if you heard that? They were guilty in one way or another, directly or indirectly, of killing God, the Son. And so you can understand their response in verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. What a powerful words right there, cut to the heart. We know what that feels like. Um, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Isn't that our normal reaction? Now we have to do something. Well, what are we going to do? We can't do anything. So Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Um, and with many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Pretty powerful day. Um, and we'll come back to that text down the road. But um, the Holy Spirit was um, powerful in that particular event. Um, and it's not something that we should always expect. Like we can't, ex it, wouldn't, it would be wrong for us to expect the Holy Spirit to come and appear with tongues of fire again. That's not going to happen. That's not how the Holy Spirit normally operates. This was something unique, a one-time event. 
Now the Holy Spirit, and it wasn't like the Holy Spirit wasn't around doing any doing something before. Absolutely was. I mean, you, we find the Spirit already in Genesis, where it says the Spirit was hovering over the waters. Um, so the Holy Spirit has been moving. The Spirit is the one in the Old Testament speaking through the prophets. So the Holy Spirit is, was actively working. Jesus did his ministry with the help of the Holy Spirit, we're told. But here, what happened was um, the Holy Spirit poured out unique gifts so that um, this was the beginning of the church. Jesus was going to be continuing his work through the church, through these disciples. And so that was made visible to them so they could understand it. Because we're, we're physical creatures. If we, it's hard for us to see things, understand things we can't see and touch and feel. And so they heard the wind. They saw the flame. They're like, okay, this is the Holy Spirit. And they got it. And we can see it by way because we have it in the Bible. Does that make sense? So the Holy Spirit is this powerful person of God um, that has this power to uh, create faith and to change lives. So, I have a question. Yes. We had friends that were Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. And I thought they believed and still believed in speaking in tongues. Right. So the question is uh, about speaking in tongues. I don't know, has anybody here, anyone else heard of that? Speaking in tongues? Yes. Yeah. So there are some Christians, I have cousins that are, um, uh, one is Assembly of God, another one is um, uh, just non-denominational. Uh, they both are pastors, kind of unique. So there are three boys in this family, me, Dennis, and Greg. They're older than I am, but we all three became pastors, you know, but separate, yeah. They were raised in Missouri City and Lutheran, but uh, anyway, it's not about them. But they, they also, at times, I remember them talking about speaking in tongues from an early age. Um, and so there is some debate among Christians among whether or not this gift of the Holy Spirit is still utilized. Um, I don't. My I'll tell you what I what I think what I see what I what I feel the Bible tells us is that as time goes on these gifts become fewer, these visible demonstrations of the Holy Spirit's power become less frequent it seems to be how god operated at different times like god still isn't parting the waters of the red sea we don't find jesus walking on the water those were unique circumstances and so at this part at this time in the early church there were those gifts and are some of those gifts maybe um just not being used i don't know but i'm not going to ever if somebody is convinced that they're speaking in tongues or somebody says they are, they, that is a fact, I'm not going to argue with them because speaking in tongues absolutely was something. And what is it? You know, Some will say that it is you speaking another language. Paul talks about what uses... He, Paul would say he'd rather... Um, you know, Even speaking in tongues, as, as amazing as that seems, he says he would rather not speak any of those languages if unless you can tell people about Jesus. That's the only thing that really matters. You know, it's not about how all these other gifts, and that's what one of the problems in the Corinthian church was. They all were pointing, trying to figure out who was the most gifted and who was big, bigger and better than the next person. And Paul says, that's if you're just a bunch of clanging cymbals. You're just making a bunch of racket. And he said what really matters is love and, and Jesus. And so... Um, I don't know, it's, not, it's hard to answer that question, you know, but I, I don't like to argue so much. It's really back to Jesus, and that's what really matters. And how the Holy Spirit operates, uh, 
you know, of course, the Holy Spirit, if he wanted to, most certainly, could, could cause somebody to speak in tongues. But then again, the purpose of the Holy Spirit causing somebody to speak in tongues here on Pentecost was what? So that other people could understand about Jesus. It wasn't just so they could babble some words. It was a language, right? It wasn't just gibberish. Yes. So that's... No, I was just going to say that's... I'm, I'm purposely trying to stay away from going down that path. and But some will... Yeah, it sounds like gibberish and doesn't sound like a language. So there's question about that. Yeah. Jim, what were you going to say? I think I was just going to kind of ride on his coattails in the sense, wasn't it just like a language so more people could understand at that time? It, it, or we're not sure. Well, on the day of Pentecost, it was a unique one-time event. Right. And absolutely... Um, they were given a gift so that those disciples who could not on their own speak all those different languages right. could tell people about Jesus. Got it, okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's a marketing. So it's getting the marketing out there. In business terms, it's marketing, I yes, guess. There we go. Getting the message out. Getting the message out. Right. <laughs> and getting the message right, too. That's, right. That's important. But anyway. Yeah, good question. So, still talking about the Holy Spirit, um, on page 16 in your workbook, on the very top, the next text that we want to look at is Galatians chapter 5. Can I ask you one question before? Yes. You? Um, getting back to verse 38, Acts chapter 2. Okay. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, do you have to be baptized to get the gift of the Holy Spirit? Is that the whole purpose of it? No. Um, so the question here is to make sure you online can hear. The question is from Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Um, is Peter's uh, comment that about being baptized and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit... Um, we're, I actually didn't go, there's more we could, we're going to actually come back to visit that text when we're oh, talking about baptism down the road. <laughs> and, but what we want to notice, though, is that baptism and Holy Spirit are connected. And it also ties in with Pentecostals who will talk about being born again mm -hmm. and having some visible demonstration of the Holy Spirit's gifts to show that you are born again, that you're not just an ordinary Christian, a second-class Christian, in order to be that first-class, born-again Christian, you know, you have to um, speak in tongues or do something. And that's sort of that mentality. But that's not biblical. So when, when somebody becomes a Christian, when they're baptized into Jesus, they are given the Holy Spirit. They, we get all of the Holy Spirit. God doesn't just give us a little bit of the Holy Spirit. He gives us all of the Holy Spirit. And then... Um, but as time goes on, he gets more and more of us. So more of our head, our th way of thinking is transformed, our way of living is transformed, um, and that takes time. So we're saved, but then the process of making us uh, less sinful, working the sin out, is a process. But that's all the work of the Holy Spirit, and so we don't have to look for more of the Holy Spirit down the road. We have all of the Holy Spirit. So, But we'll talk more about that down the road. Um, you did hear, I don't know if I can remember how this goes exactly, but you did hear about the lady um, who was an uh, elderly lady. She was held up. Uh, somebody broke into her home and with a gun. And uh, the lady was shocked. She didn't know what to do. And so all she did was yell out Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38, that's all she could think of. Because what does Acts 2.38 say? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So she was this, you know, serious, sincere Christian just yelling out the only verse. She just thought of that reference and just kept saying it. And um, the... Uh, 
guy surrendered, he gave up. And she called the police and the police showed up and um, he uh, told the police that, uh, the police asked why, why he gave up. And he, he told them that this woman had an ax and two thirty eights. <laughs> you probably heard that already, but but I thought that's cute, you know. Ax two, yeah, two and two thirty eight. So anyway, I heard that one a long time ago, so I didn't remember see if I could get that one out right. But anyway, great. it's cute. All right, Galatians chapter five, uh, page eighteen. 1816. So again, who is the Holy Spirit? Uh, so sometimes the way that we can better understand who God is is by looking at what he does. So what does God the Holy Spirit do? One of the things that he does is he works something in us called the fruit of the Spirit. That's what we read about in Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 and 23. Anybody care to read that? Okay. All right, go ahead. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. All right, so notice it says fruit of the Spirit not fruits. So the Holy Spirit works in every single Christian all of this fruit. This fruit is something that we can expect to find in ourselves and in other Christians. So there's no such thing as a Christian who does not have, you know, is missing one of these things. So when you run into somebody who's a little, you know, crass and grumpy, well, that's just, I'm just, I'm just grumpy. You know, I, I don't, I'm not, or I'm not very patient. Well, that's what it goes back to. The Holy Spirit is working on getting more and more of us. And we're all guilty because we're all sinners. And uh, so there are parts of us, the way we're wired, you know, God's work is never finished. There's a t-shirt, you know, you've probably all seen the saying somewhere, um, be patient, God isn't finished with me yet. And that is so true. Because what he is working in us are all these things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are all the things that the Holy Spirit is um, producing in us. All right. Um, and what is the tool that, that the Holy Spirit uses to work this faith in us? Well, we have it open right now, the Bible, God's Word. That's what God is using, the Holy Spirit is using. So um, that's why it's so important, again, to be in the Bible. It's not just to learn. It's so the Holy Spirit has this tool at work in our hearts and produces those things in us that He wants. All right, let's look at, uh, turn left from Galatians, go to Romans 12. For those of you at home or those of you without a book, uh, we have just three texts left, this one and then two more. Actually, just two, this one and one more, and that's it. Romans 12, 6 through 8, 1764. All right, so um, let let me ask if someone would be willing to read. All right, Jim. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. 
If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. All right, so here um, the key word is gifts. So to every person is given a gift or maybe multiple gifts. We don't all have the same gifts. Like I said before with the fruit, all the, the Holy Spirit is producing in uh, each of us all of the those fruit. But God, doesn't, God the Holy Spirit doesn't work all gifts in all of us. To one, maybe we have a gift of showing mercy or... Um, there's a, in, so there's another list in 1 Corinthians 12. One, and there they list hospitality. We all know people who are here, he talks about encouraging. I, I bet in every one of our lives, and Nicole, maybe you as a teacher uh, who works with young people, but you know, maybe we would call a teacher, a special teacher, or maybe a special coach, somebody who was, a, who was gifted at encouraging, who, who, who believed in us, who said, you can do this. And uh, so that is a gift. And what I like about this text and the other one that Paul uses, and those aren't complete lists either, but he lists their gifts that we don't always think about as gifts. Right? When we think about the Holy Spirit giving gifts, we sometimes think about the more public, high-profile, you know, like pastors. Well, I'm not, I can never be a pastor. And then you think, well, you don't have any gifts. Well, most certainly you do. We just have different gifts. And so... Um, yeah, so you maybe your gift is leadership. There are people who are just wired to be great leaders. And that is a gift. And so that's one of the things I just personally wanted to share. I really like these lists because I want just to affirm each one of you that you have gifts of the Holy Spirit. You are not without gifts. There is something God has gifted each one of you in a special way. You are unique, special, important. All right. All right. Um, one more text. Uh, Romans 8. Romans 8. Uh, in particular, Romans 8, verse 26. So this is page... 1757, Barbara says. Somehow I knew you'd be there. That's great. Would somebody read Romans chapter 8, verse 26? I'll read it. Go ahead. Yeah. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. All right, so the Holy Spirit here is, we're told, one of his jobs is to pray for us. Brings our case before the Father. And even when we are so weak, we don't even, we're out of words. We don't know what to say. Here's the Holy Spirit lifting us up. I, as I get older, I am more, I am less able to fully comprehend just how, how vast and deep God is and what he's doing for us. You know, I am, I feel like just as a human being, my, I am so shallow where God is just so deep. He is so involved in our lives, deeper than what we can ever imagine. And here when we, when, you know, maybe God is the last thing on our mind, here's the Holy Spirit pleading for us, lifting us up before God. And, uh, you know, I think we, we all, may, there may be at times in life that have been really difficult and we've felt, you know, pain, loneliness, all, you know, lots of different things, but we've never truly been alone. Here's this God who died for us, who loves us, who's pleading for us. And, uh, and so from beginning to end, we'll talk about this more, but 
from beginning to end of life, from the moment life begins to all the way until we get to heaven, God is intimately involved in our lives, providing for us, caring for us, working in us, working through us, using us for his glory, the good of others. So, so here is this God who is Father, who is Son, who is Holy Spirit, three separate persons and yet one God. Can't quite grasp that, but that's who he is. So there's not three gods, there's only one God, but there's three persons. The Muslims will accuse us of be worshiping multi-gods. And we'll say, no, there's only one God. And, you know, then they'll say, well, great. But then we'll say there's three persons. And then right away they'll say, no, okay, you're, you're all screwed up. And then, of course, we say Jesus is God the Son. And then you know, we lost them. They'll say he's a great prophet. Um, but, uh, so just so we're clear, one God, three persons. So, all right. Um, there's one question that on page 17 in our workbook, I'm going to, we have time here, so I'm going to read it and see what any, if any of you have some responses to it. All right, so the question is, new Christians often accuse God of being cruel because he will, quote, send some people to hell. In light of God, being both just and merciful, discuss this accusation. Let me read it again. New Christians often accuse God of being cruel because, quote, he will send some people to hell. In light of God, being both just and merciful, discuss this accusation. So how would you respond to someone who says, you know, God is cruel for sending people to hell. I really struggle with that. Remember, we're taught this is... Um, talking about Christians saying this. They've come to faith, but they're wrestling with this problem. They're, they have this idea that God is somehow cruel because of hell. How would you respond? If there, is there anything that you know, anything we've talked about that you could think of would be a way for us to respond, perhaps, now that you know a little bit about God? Not, not now, but having known him and have, after our conversations about God. Because they don't believe, they're not sorry for their sins. They don't believe that Jesus died for our sins. Yeah, I think that's a great place to start. So rather than placing the blame or the fault on God, is maybe looking at, Somebody who's saying no, no, thank you. I don't want that, right? Right. So that's a, a good place to start, right? Any anyone else? You know, I'll mention. Um, you've. I think you probably have heard me say now in the last few weeks. One of the reasons for this class is not just to help people become members that this class really is designed to do more than that, is to help people be those missionary disciples so that, to, so that you're able to teach and witness and do the things that God has called us to, to do as the church. And of course, you're not going to, after this class, you're not going to know everything there is in the Bible. After all my years of training and, and studying it to be pastor, and even after all my years of being pastor, I... <laughs> it's just a joke to, for me to even suggest I know everything. So we're not going to know everything, but at least you're on the way to growing, um, to being that. So anyway, this is one of those questions you might run into. So it's really great. So here's, I'll tell you how we, um, how I like to think about, or how we might respond and at least get you started with thinking some thoughts here. Um, so when somebody is thinking about God being cruel and the reality of hell. First of all, hell is real. Jesus, there's nobody who talks more about hell than Jesus. And Jesus doesn't say hell is going to be empty. In fact, Jesus says there's going to be more people in hell than in heaven. Broad is the road that leads to hell. Narrow is the way that leads to heaven. 
And so that is a frightening thought. Is that eternal? Eternal. The Bible refers to um, eternal death describing hell and heaven being eternal life. So people at their death go one of two directions, either heaven or hell. And Catholics traditionally sometimes have talked about a purgatory, but that is nowhere in the Bible. And that's, that's about the idea of people kind of earning some credits, enough credits to go to heaven, and that maybe there's enough good works, some extra good works that you know, others have done that you can somehow gain for yourself so you can get into heaven. It's such a mistaken teaching. You know, it's, it's really um, disrespecting Jesus and the, work, the finished work on the cross that he did. It's like Jesus didn't do enough. But um, so hell is real. It's eternal, according to the Bible. You know, again, um, I, when I answer a question, I'm always trying to answer not what I think, but what does the Bible say? So the Bible talks about hell being eternal, um, and, but look at what kind of God we have. How I like to respond to this is, yes, hell is real. But look at what kind of God we have. That We have a God who is willing to come and stand between hell and a world full of sinners so that no one would have to go to hell. In fact, if anybody is going to go to hell, they have to go through Jesus. They're going to have to say no I do not want you, Jesus. No, thank you. And God will honor their request. God doesn't force anyone. And that's why in the beginning, Adam and Eve were given the opportunity to push him away. God didn't create robots who just, like a doll that you buy in a store and you pull the string and it just repeats back, I love you, I love you, I love you. That God didn't want that. God wanted real people who had the freedom to force love. You know, the saying, there's a saying, force love is no love at all. So um, God wanted, in order to love, you have that option, that freedom to push him away. And we know the story, how that played out. But then look at what God did. God didn't just, in his anger, destroy everything and start over. He could have, but he didn't. And he was willing to come down and die on a cross. He took the only God forsaken, I've said this before, God took that only God forsaken spot so that nobody would have to. He went to hell so nobody would have to go there. So that's the kind of God we have. So the Bible says God does not delight in the, in the death of the wicked. In fact, the Bible says he wants all people to be saved and go to heaven. What about a person that commits suicide? So the question that uh, Jim asked is, what about the person who commits suicide? Um, there's only one sin in the Bible that says is unforgivable. And it's not suicide. Um, sin, obvious, or suicide is certainly sin. It's taking one's own life. It's murdering yourself. And so it absolutely is a sin, but it is not... Like I said, there's only one sin that is unforgivable. Um, and that is the continued willful rejection of the Holy Spirit until you die. In other words, the only sin is really rejecting Jesus' gift of forgiveness over and over again. That's all. So if, you, if anybody's ever worried, like I, I remember as a kid in confirmation, I went to a Lutheran um, school, day school, and I remember wondering, and somebody maybe asked, I don't know if I did or not, but somebody asked, you know, what if we're, what if we're guilty of that? And I remember the pastor saying, and this is true, that, you know, if you're worried about whether or not you have, you know you haven't, because you have not rejected the Holy Spirit, you've not rejected Jesus. Um, and... Uh, and so with the, in the case of suicide, yes, that person died in the process of sinning. But that does not automatically condemn someone to hell. If, 
I, I mean, I, when Jesus comes back, knowing myself and knowing that I'm a sinner and knowing that I sin regularly, you know, in my thoughts or whatever, I might have a rash thought. What if Jesus comes back right in that moment? Now what? If going to heaven depended on whether or not I was not sinning at any given moment, I'd be scared to death. I ain't getting there. I know. Because nobody deserves to be there. So the people that go to hell do deserve to go. We all deserve to go to hell. So at this point, he will send some people to hell. Well, if he does... So now the question is, who says he's sending people to hell? They're sending, They're sending themselves sin. there. Yes. They're rejecting Jesus. They're rejecting saying no. And God's offer is a free gift, fully paid. You, everyone is given a free ticket to heaven through Jesus, paid in full. Who would say no to that? Right? But... Well, there's a lot of people out there. Yes. That they are. That's right. But, again, going back to you wanting to just add, keep in mind that they are casualties of the enemy. They're not the enemy. Yeah. They Sin left them dead. And so it's not because we are so smart or so good. It's because God, the Holy Spirit, has worked in us. So we are really no different than them. We, we can't take credit for it, for our salvation. All we can do is boast in the Lord and say, look at what God has done for me. And so, you know, People outside the church will accuse us of thinking that we're better than they are. But that's just the opposite. We know we're sinners in need of a Savior. You're the ones out there who think you don't need a Savior. <laughs> and we want to tell you, you do, like we do. We know, how, we know we're sinners. And we'd like to tell you about this Jesus. So. But anyway, some, some good thoughts there. All right, so what I'm going to do, 7.33, this next video, the video that I'm going to show you is like 10 minutes long. It'll take me 10 minutes to turn on the TV and the, <laughs> and the CD player. So, so we've got time, though. Uh, so, uh, I am going to, uh, I think for the purpose of this, Right now, I'm going to turn off the camera. Uh, I saw, I'll say this, I saw Wendy, you sent a text. Uh, let me quickly check here on camera and see. Um, okay, so um, not able to join us. So, Wendy, if you watch this video or watch this uh, class here tonight, um, we're thinking about you. I'm going to turn off the camera. We, we just finished Chapter 3. I'm going to show a video on the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. So that's what we're going to watch. I'm going to turn this off.